One thing about M is that he can't feel he has to buy you dinner. He can afford his dinner and yours, but if he buys yours, well then it's just another thing he bought. Naomi and I are walking with Scott the archaeologist, having never asked to attend this dinner. We're walking the Istiklal Jadesi, once the Grand Rue de Pera, Istanbul's Champs-Élysées, now its Baroque passages and arcades were filled with ersatz Turkish fashion brands. Mavi, Collection, Penti. We walked with Scott as best three people could walk together on the Istiklal, three people who want to get somewhere. The dudes in pre-distressed denim jibbed through crowds of, modest but, uh, of the modest, but still no one got anywhere or cared. I was reminded of a description of the Ottoman era. Each ethnicity and profession had its own walk. The Janissaries did a kind of sweep. I did, shared this with Naomi. She said it sounded like Monty Python. Scott walks like an archaeologist. How's that? Like someone who's going to keep picking away at that patch of dirt. Like someone who's going to keep brushing away at that pot fragment. We had fallen quite behind. The restaurant was a white tablecloth gloss on traditional Turkish drinking food. We were the only ones there for a 6 p.m. seating, though Scott occupied our table with fierce possessiveness. They have a sister restaurant in Bodrum, the kind of place a man like M would go. Bodrum is a beach town, almost European in permissiveness. It was also once Halicarnassus, hometown of Herodotus and site of the mausoleum, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. There is also a giant disco there called Halicarnassus that we once unfortunately stayed across the street from. How is it that you know one another? We went to school together, M, Helena, and I in Beirut, Scott said. Helena was why Naomi and I were there. She was, of all things, a church friend of my mother, Harvard, then Yale School of Management. She looked it too, and I mean that in the best possible way. This dinner was supposed to be some kind of favor to us. We were new to the city, but Naomi and I were also two college instructors set to pay our share of a dinner with Scott the archaeologist, Helena the hedge fund manager, and M. We'd been nursing glasses of the usual overpriced Turkish wine, the white kind made from Thompson seedless grapes. Scott was giving us Turkish pronunciation lessons. The word for red, for red wine is pronounced with a hard K in muted vowels, kremize, not unlike crimson. The restaurant was across from the old American consulate building. We lived in a world where its 10-foot walls were judged insecure. The new consulate had been fortified into a hillside. The only thing within a half mile was a Turkish version of Costco. Scott, it's so wonderful to see you. Is it, M isn't here yet. Helena's a bank person, direct. Poor Scott wilted a little. In the cab ride before the walk, he'd been telling us both about being flown to M spread in Bukhara for the annual party. Two Uzbek families M allowed to live in the wings of the Tsarist era palace cleaned the place up, and everyone guzzled Kyrgyz champagne and drank in the unbridled air of the desert. You had to imagine Scott there a waspy tweed jacket of a man with a brain full of dead culture, skirting the edges of the kind of people Oliver Stone would like to machine gun if he could prove they existed. Naomi ordered another glass of wine. The word for white, one of the two, is easy, beaz. Add a T and you get lightning. From church, I knew Helena had a glad-handing husband and two kids bound for the ivies. Seeing her alone, it was clear she was the outer electron of her atomic family. As she was asking how we found living in Istanbul, she crossed and uncrossed her legs like Sharon Stone. Scott seemed embarrassed for her. We should order a few things. M will want the octopus. They do well with the octopus here. They have someone down in Bodrum who must just beat the hell out of it. It's the only way you know, otherwise it's chewy. I always find it chewy. I watched Helena scan the menu. You know these days I really only eat steak. It's the only clean food. You can never know what's in these pastes, these dips. Then they expect you to eat them with bread and salads. Even if they're clean, there's always something hidden. The nuts, the cheese, the dressing. The Turks don't eat steak. They just don't. Lamb, sure, meatballs, but not steak. 
Scott pointed out with academic helpfulness. I was reminded of Hemingway's dispatch from Istanbul in 1922 for the Toronto Star. He said the steak was so tough he grew bulldog jowls. He also said the national dish of turkey is turkey. One could truly say his career as a fiction writer began here, just down the street at the Biuk Londra Hotel. And then M was there like a vampire making no entrance at all. He was gaunt with a kind of delicacy about him. Helena was already feeling out about Afghanistan. Were they really going to get heavy metals out of there to India and Pakistan with the security situation being what it was? They don't call it the graveyard of empires for nothing, Scott trying to get in a word edgewise. M cupped his jaw, turning to Naomi. You Turkish? Naomi demurred. You could be Turkish, they'd have you. Turning to me, you not so much. <laughs> when the octopus arrived, M speared a leg. You could tell from the way his suit moved it was expensive. Helena was still feeling out the Afghan deal. If it were more than a myth, she had some interested parties. Naomi and I were eating the dips on the bread. Scott was taking small bites of the dips with a fork. His fork veered close to the octopus, but thought better of it. Naomi asked her same question. How do you all know each other? At the American Community School, Scott had positioned himself as the gatekeeper to the virtue of Helena and her sister. Ha, if that was his position, he didn't do such a great job, Helena smiled. I just didn't want my friends with the usual sons of oil men, you know, the ones who grew up on compounds in the Philippines, uh, grilling commissary hamburgers by the pool. ACS is just full of those brats. And M was certainly not one of those worthy oriental gentlemen through and through. Edward Said would be rolling in his grave. No, Scott, I always knew what I was. He hadn't touched the octopus. He turned to Naomi. Do you know how I came to do what I do? M studied hydrological engineering, a sly pride in Helena's voice. If I recall, it was because he wanted to help the people of Egypt. There was something of the new Arab in him then, Scott added. I was trying to get financing for an irrigation project in Aswan. We were at the old Cataract. It's a charming hotel with an onion dome and a full tea service daily, much grander than the Parapalas over there, the Thomas Cook Hotel built by the man himself. I made my presentation, thought it went quite well. Then I overheard two of the financiers pulling it apart over drinks at the mahogany bar. It was African mahogany, but Cook had it carpented in leads. I realized then I was made of the same stuff as those men at the bar, and if I could carve myself in their image, I would never find myself in that position again. And now I am, for Mrs. J.P. Morgan and Company, master of everything from Tangier to Tashkent. Spoken like the Grand Vizier Kara Mustafa Pasha, strangled with silk cord in Belgrade, very sad, Scott added. You should come see my collection of ikats, still to Naomi, ignoring Scott. Each year I go to Bukhara twice, when the tribes converge on the city to do trade. In the summer I fly the best people out to drink Kyrgyz champagne by the lake. Have you ever seen the moon rise above a true oasis surrounded by the Kizlikum? The red sand. Kiz, the other word for red. Kizkanchalik, the word for envy, puts the word blood and red and makes it an adjective. Lick is like adding an ish. There is nothing Naomi could say but no. But the, the winter is a time to best buy the best textiles. Tribes are at rest, and the women weave ikats to warm the yurts. I take my lyca to the encampments to capture the ones I cannot buy. Ikats are one of the few things in the world I cannot simply buy if I want. The nomads need them to survive the winter, and they are smart enough to hold survival above capital. This is all stuff he learned from Eugenie. Eugenie taught him to be a collector, Scott said. It's true, she used to say, it's a want that doesn't allow you any peace. You go to bed and you still want it. Then when you've got it and missed however many meals to pay for it, you feel terrible. I don't miss meals anymore, but I still feel the want. He said this all looking at Naomi. You know, Em, you should come out to the site I'm on. Gobekli Tepe predates agricultural civilization by 5,000 years. Hunter-gatherers built it in their spare time. 
carved these incredible animalistic figures. Is there anything written on it? No, God, no. Writing was invented to keep accounts, cuneiform tables. They're just a list of who owes whom how much grain. Gobekli Tepe is from a time before that, before buying and selling. I can't imagine a time before buying and selling. I'm sure they were bartering or something. Helena seemed about done rearranging the food on her plate. But M looked like he was seriously trying to imagine a world without money. A smile curved his waxy face. You know, we've got to be up early to teach, I said, really hoping Naomi wouldn't contradict me. I pulled the cash out of my wallet, something shy of 150 new Turkish lira. Let me buy your meals. No, thank you, I insist. Though I didn't know if it would really cover our part, I put the money in front of Scott and offered handshakes all around. M's was firm, but not American firm, not competitive eye meeting like two dogs on the sidewalk. It had the feeling of inevitability that truly frightened me. Naomi finally rose from her seat. I gave Helen a hug. Tell my mother hi if you see her at church. Out of the corner of my eye, I watched M give Naomi three elegant cheek, uh, cheek kisses, a la turca, as the French say. We walked home. The early fall air was full of the acrid smell of chestnut vendors. They burned the shells to roast the nuts. So are you going to book a ticket to Bukhara? I tried jostling. You won't be able to take this seriously, I can tell. But in another situation, I think I could have been M's friend, Naomi said. People don't imagine it snows in Istanbul. But then again, they imagine camels parked outside the Blue Mosque, which isn't true either. We were up on the Istiklal again four months later. It was clear of foot traffic thanks to the cold, and we were enjoying window shopping. The arcades are melancholy artifacts of vanished good times. Someday the same will be said for the city's crystalline shopping centers, just as it is said of the Grand Bazaar, whose name in Turkish merely means covered market. One of those winds that feels right off the Ukrainian steppe must have hit a sagging bank of Marmara moisture because snow started lashing at us. Snow in Istanbul is wet, it turns even the young arthritic. We ducked into one of the holding com company's cultural centers. There must have been a tax incentive because there are a number of them, and no one seemed to know what was being exhibited in these cultural centers and why. In this one, it was what Eugenie saw. It was a photography exhibit. Those large format photos best taken with a Leica. Photos of prints, or rather woven patterns. Naomi got right up to the photos, sort of like you might a Pollock or a Rothko. I read the exhibition Fronts piece because I like my aesthetic experiences mitigated by knowledge. After some early biography, Eugenie Book was from a well-to-do Manhattan family, I came on this. Also in evidence is Eugenie Book's understanding of color and design, the way different weavers could recreate a theme. Though she never said this in print, she thought the tragedy of modern Turkey was the loss of the nomad's purposeful, dignified life, especially for women whose self-expression Eugenie so tenderly documents in these photos of Ikats. Eugenie was adopted as the mother of the Kamaluks, a Western Mongolian tribe for cutting red tape after the Second World War to ensure that a group of Kamaluk refugees were not returned to face Stalin's wrath but resettled in New Jersey instead. What am I looking at? Naomi asked me. Ikats. Back in our apartment, our coats and pants left in a puddle in the hall, Naomi was on the internet. The kettle hadn't stopped whistling when Naomi tipped her chair over. She was on her feet. Snow was pelting the living room window. Behind her was the couch where I thought we'd be in the next minute with hot tea and a pirated movie. We saw everything those days, as long as it was in English. M's dead. What? That's terrible. How do you know? I mean, how'd you find out? Do we have any wine? Of course we did, but only white. I think I want red. Do you have some cash? I'll just go up to the guy. Really? It's a mess out there. But don't you think some red wine would be nice? The tide shifted in her tone. It rolled in over whatever had been revealed in its receding. I gave her the cash and she pulled on her wet jeans over goose pimpled legs. Open on her computer was an article from Fortune. It was about J.P. Morgan's gold extraction efforts in Afghanistan. I read, this email from Hunum about his colleague and friend, M died in a plane crash in Kurdistan yesterday. Any good photos I can give the family? Em and Hunam had flown out of Afghanistan on a private plane and then gone their separate ways. 
M had taken the plane to Kurdistan. The plane crashed in a snowstorm, and M and another J.P. Morgan banker were killed. Hunam was devastated. From the meeting at the Baghdad hunting club, M had been a champion of the Afghan venture. He had believed mining could make a difference for the country. His death and the attack on the mine were sobering reminders of the personal risks of frontier capitalism. I scrolled up the article to find out who Hunam was. He'd come up through the artist's rifles, a poor kid out for adventure. As part of the special air service, he guarded airstrips in Oman. Then he watched oil men get rich. After his discharge, he went to work for Shell BP in Nigeria, first securing the Bonnie Light crude, then exploring for more. He was a man for whom extraction was a passion. The article described a scene of Hunam visiting a village in the valley adjacent to the gold mine. I read, Hunam's close friend M, responsible for J.P. Morgan's investment banking practice in Central Asia and the Middle East, made portraits of villagers with a Leica film camera. The other banker who died on M's flight had brought the Bin Laden fortune into the Carlisle group. The restaurant where I choose to meet, meet Helena serves steak. It was the Algeria restaurant off the Algeria Alley. The Algeria Alley was actually a staircase, accounted charming by some, lined with hookah bars. The Algeria Alley used to be the French Alley, since it was near the French Lycée, but when the French government recognized the Armenian genocide as such, the mayor of Istanbul changed the street name to remind them of their own colonial guilt, he said at the time. You could see the Algeria restaurant from our window. Naomi wasn't coming. Don't say I'm sick. She'd gone to the living room with her laptop. Helena was my mother's church friend after all, and if Naomi's parents ever had church friends coming through Istanbul, she'd meet them alone if I wanted. Also, if it's just you, there's a better chance she'll pick up the check. Spring kicks up in Istanbul like an awkward foal. The one tree on our street had just greened. Helena was there already with a big glass of red wine. She was on a layover from Rwanda. You can't imagine how that place is turned around. Is the steak here good? I had no idea, but she ordered it anyway. I ordered some kind of braised lamb. The food was Mediterranean, which means hotel food. I made some excuse for Naomi. She's not feeling well. Helena shrugged, off, shrugged it off, preferring to tell me about her daughter's accomplishments. One almost certainly going to Penn, almost certainly going to med school. The other had taken an interest in Islamic women's fashion. Did I know anywhere she could take snapshots of headscarves with her iPhone? I demurred. Neighborhoods with headscarves were neighborhoods without bars. Elena ordered another Cabernet and encouraged me to do the same. I figured I should broach the subject. I'm sorry about M. M. Such a tragedy, M. I thought that would be it. Let me tell you something about M. When I went to talk to his so-called wife about the funeral arrangements, I asked her about what poems or literary works he valued, and she said he never read. I thought I would read something, but she said he never studied, he didn't care for it. At which point I realized that maybe he wasn't a genuinely deep person, just a shopper with a good eye. He kept scholars around, he listened to them, but I think all he was interested, that all that interested him was the gathering of the textiles, the owning them. She took a slug of wine, Cabernet, something the Turks grow a little of for those who hadn't the taste for their trademark blend of throat closer and ox eye grapes. I mean, I knew him as a friend. He was a serial philanderer, you know. That's very damaging. I mean, his wife, his so-called wife, wouldn't marry him because she couldn't deal with it. His son wouldn't deal with it. At the funeral, all he had was formalities. There was a woman at work who was stalking him. They had all the firm's security at the London Memorial to stop her from showing up. The prospect of her showing up gave his so-called wife a heart attack, which at the hospital turned out to be a panic attack. So you were at the funeral? At the funeral, my husband asked the head of the firm's security. He asked, so the plane went down a snowstorm. The guy grunted. Yeah, I went to investigate this little airstrip. The guy who runs a tea shop also manages the air traffic. He said to me, the plane went down a major snowstorm, but there is a, just a dirty inch of snow on the ground. That's all I'm saying, a dirty inch. An English funeral is such a brand, like an Italian wedding. I couldn't help but picture Hugh Grant reading something by Yeats as Helena, her husband, and her overachieving children tighten their faces. Lake Isle of Innisfree? Not for M, apparently. 
I imagined him in a gilded sarcophagus, his chariots and his so-called wife sealed into the burial chamber, or angry villagers burying his coffin upside down. But I didn't know the man. The thing was, nobody knew whether he was the most significant player in the firm holding together the accounts of the Middle East and Central Asia, or if he was on the edge of being fired. Nobody knew exactly what he did, CIA. When he brought his house in Bukhara, he displaced 45 people, paid them all off, went there twice a year and would walk around with a wad of bills paying off neighbors. His so-called wife had to sell. She just couldn't handle that. The Algeria restaurant was housed in a workers' benevolent society from the era of the Ottoman capitulations. Europeans who'd come to Istanbul to monetize the creaking empire's underutilized resources would store their women and children in a building like this. The restaurant sprawled through drawing rooms and dining rooms and a garden planted with linden trees. The chapel made for a nice bar. Above there were a few rooms available for the night. Not a proper hotel, not advertised. If I were M, would we take our after dinner drinks in one of them? The dining room we were in was papered in da crimson damask. He was a very loyal man in other ways. Loyal to the woman who taught him textiles, he'd cheat on his so-called wife. He had women in every city, but he was never late for her, and she was a mean old bitch. She lived here, did I ever mention that? That's why I loved it here. It was like he could borrow her eyes to see it. She lived in this garret, just packed to the gills with textiles and portfolios of photos. He was always bothering her to move to a bigger place. He'd pay, of course, but she never did. Back in the apartment, Naomi had poured herself a goblet of wine. We had big glasses. Turkish red wine needs a lot of air to loosen the tannins. Did you say I was sick? You might be if you drink all that. So you did. What did you expect me to do? She took a thoughtful sip. Naomi was one of those women who all cultures wanted to claim. If the taxi driver was Lebanese, she had to be from Tripoli. If uh, we went for uh, if we went for Italian or Mexican back in the States, they'd swear she was from Syracuse or Deafe. Did you guys talk about M? A little. Turns out she didn't know him that well. Did you learn anything? He was rich, he loved textiles, he died in a plane crash. So nothing new. I went and poured myself the rest of the bottle. It wasn't a bad wine. Special cave. They aged throat closer and oxide with oak chips, which gave it an almost French nose. Wicked hangover, though. Thanks. Thanks again, Julia.